I've got to tell you about what happened last week, though. This is interesting. Last Sunday, I uh, spoke at the chapel service where we're living now at Fellowship Square. They have a chapel service at 3 o'clock. And uh, so I was scheduled to speak. And <clears throat> last time I spoke there, I didn't have this problem with my voice. And I, I prayed. I said, Lord, <laughs> Lord, uh, y you've got to help me do this. Help this sound system to work because I have a great one here. I don't have to speak out loud. But over there, uh, I know the sound system is just kind of like this. So uh, I got over there, and, and the fellow that was presiding started to use a mic, and it died. And so the people in the back were saying, can't hear. Now, this is a crowd, you know, that has hearing problems. Okay, so you have to have a, you have to be able to speak so they can hear you. And uh, so he changed the mic out for another mic, and he got that, and that one died. So he went to a third mic, and it also didn't, didn't do hardly anything. So I didn't have any amplification, and uh, I had to, uh, well, I did whatever I did, I did. And uh, the interesting thing about this is, you know what the topic was that I was speaking on? What do you do when God says no to your prayers? <laughs> that was my subject. I'm not sure what God did, but uh, he said no to that particular prayer. <laughs> Fortunately, I have a sound system that I can use and that actually works here. You know, we've, uh, for the last six weeks, we have been dealing with uh, the Bible and uh, 40 days in the Word. And it was over last week. I preached the last message and we had the last session in our small groups. But I wanted to add one more message, kind of a, a message with a little different appeal to it. And that's why I want to speak on this subject. What does it mean to believe the Bible? We've talked about the Bible, how it changes us how we build our lives upon the Bible and all those different subjects, but what does it mean to believe the Bible? You know, most of you here this morning are generally aware of the liberal conservative divide in the churches of our country and also across the world. And you can probably name uh, those churches or those denominations that would fit under either label, liberal, conservative. You probably also realize, I certainly hope you do, that Cactus Christian Fellowship is a conservative church. But what do those labels mean? And where do uh, religious liberals come from? You know, I think we make a mistake when we assume that liberalism starts outside the church, as if it were a kind of alien invasion of the church. Liberalism arises as a kind of heresy of evangelical Bible-believing churches. We identify liberals as persons who reject the Bible, the church, and even Jesus. But liberals would say, at least from their point of view, that their first ambition was to honor the Bible, honor the church, and honor Jesus. In actuality, religious liberalism did not originate from outside the church. It originated from within the church. Now, I say that because the Apostle John recognized the same thing happening in the first generation of the church. Although he referred to them as antichrists, he said this, they went out from us, but, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. That's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. Now, several years ago, a man by the name of Gregory Wills discussed this question in an article that he wrote called, What Lessons Can We Learn from the History of Liberalism? And one of the things he said was this, secular educated persons did not merely reject Christianity as untrue. They also scorned it as disreputable and absurd. Based on evolutionary thinking, intellectuals increasingly concluded that Christianity, like religion generally, belonged to the childhood of the human race. But now that humanity had reached its maturity, it would stand upon enlightened and scientific reason and would discard its religious superstitions. So, wanting to be more up to date and more relevant to secular thinking, the liberals within the church proposed a new view of biblical inspiration that made room for the prevailing scientific consensus. No longer were Christians shackled by a 
by a literal reading of Genesis chapters 1 through 3. No longer did they have to defend floating axe heads and talking donkeys and a man who walked on water. Now they could keep the words of Jesus while dismissing the outmoded trappings of superstition. The end result was a Christianity expressed in naturalistic terms. So Mr. Wills goes on. Liberals were convinced that they could preserve the spiritual truth of the Bible on this basis. They were wrong. They intended to rescue the faith. But in making Christianity more credible to the world, they replaced it with a religion according to the world. Now, Wills is quite right when he says also that modern, the modern generation of evangelicals, that's us, is repeating the same mistake in the name of making Christianity credible to an unbelieving world. They've actually pulled out some of the bricks of the foundation. If the history of liberalism has proved anything, surely it has proved that the gospel must be accepted on its own terms. Not on the terms of the despisers, however cultured, educated, and successful they may be. So here's the crucial question that was, that, that that's just, this message is all about. Will we believe the Bible, all of it, every word of it, from first to last, and everything in between? Will we? Our spiritual ancestors had no problem saying yes to that. But we struggle with it today. That controversy over the Bible continues to our present day. And I want us to answer one very important question. What does it mean to believe the Bible? It's one thing to say that we believe the Bible. It's quite another to live that out on a daily basis. So what do we mean when we say that we believe the Bible? Well, using, I'm going to use a, a passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 16. We can discover the three answers to this particular question that I asked. And you'll see the text up here, or you can turn to it in your own Bibles. Number one, believing the Bible means accepting its authority in every area of life. Let me repeat that. Believing the Bible means accepting its authority in every area of life. From verse 13 of that text, the Apostle Paul says, And we thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you have heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Paul uses two words in verse 13 to explain what he means. First of all, he said, number one, you received the word of God. That's the hearing of the ear. It's objective. It's like signing a receipt at the post office that you, can, that you accepted a passage, a package. Paul means that the Thessalonians listened intently to the message he preached because they knew it came from God. The second word he uses, he says, you accepted it as the word of God. This word means to, to welcome a visitor into your home. This is the hearing of the heart. It's subjective. It's one thing to listen to a sermon. It's something else to welcome God's message into your heart and let it transform your life. This explains why some people can come to church for 60 years and never be changed. We've all known lifelong church members who were as grouchy and greedy and cranky and as mean-spirited as they were at the beginning. They received the word week after week, but they never accepted it as God's divine message for them. So they were never changed on the inside. Now the focus here is crucial. You heard the message from man, but you recognized that it came from God. You heard from us, that's the human side. God's message, that's the divine side. So you responded, not as if it were the opinion of man, but as it really was, the Word of God. Every Christian needs to think about that because we're living in the days of spiritual anarchy where society has rejected the Word of the Lord. You know that. You see what's going on in our society. Are we willing to be men and women who do what we are told as disciples of our Lord, even when it isn't popular? God help us to answer yes. That we live, that we that we will live, that we truly believe what the Bible says. Now let me ask you an important question. 
If Oprah Winfrey asked you on national TV to give your position on homosexuality, what would you say? That's the dilemma that was faced by T.D. Jakes. I don't know if you know T.D. Jakes, a black pastor of the, of the uh, Potter's House, which is a mega church in uh, Dallas, Texas. Some time ago when he was a guest on her show, he was asked that question. And before I tell you what he said, I want to point out one fact. This is a tough question in one sense because, as you well know, the tide is definitely running against those of us who believe in the traditional family and who accept the Bible as the true word of God. <laughs> the tide is running well against us. A Los Angeles Times article carried this provocative headline. It said, Americans increasingly in favor of gay marriage. The article goes on to say that 47% of those surveyed found favored gay marriage, while 43% opposed it. Now, whenever Christians speak out on homosexuality, we face certain challenges, don't we? Number one, we're very likely to be opposed, right? Number two, we may be branded as bigots. And number three, we may even be misunderstood by our own people. Times have changed even inside the evangelical churches. Many people are pressing us to stop calling homosexuality sinful and to admit gays and lesbians to church membership as they are. Sometimes we are unfairly linked with extremists like that crazy church in Kansas that spouts hateful rhetoric at funerals. We also know that we are here to speak the truth in love. But how do you do that to a whole generation that denies the very concept of truth? Let me go back to T.D. Jakes for a moment. I'm aware of the controversy surrounding his views on the Trinity and the prosperity gospel. Those are serious issues that need to be further talked about, but uh, that's not my point in this message. I'm simply using him as an illustration since he was, in fact, asked by Oprah Winfrey to give his opinion as a pastor on homosexuality. Oprah has been one of the most beloved women in this country, and whether or not we watch her is beside the point. Millions of people hang on her every word. How do you communicate the essence of the biblical viewpoint in just a few sentences when the cameras are rolling and her studio audience is listening very carefully. Well, this is how T.D. Jakes answered the question. He said this, I'm not called to give my opinion. I'm called as a pastor to give the scriptural position on it. That doesn't mean that I have to agree with you to love you. I don't dislike anybody. I love everybody. And then he went on to expand on that by, uh, on that by saying this, I think that sex between two people of the same gender is condemned in the scriptures. And as long as it is condemned in the scriptures, I don't get to say what I think. I only get to say what the Bible says. I think this is a great way to handle a difficult topic on national TV, don't you? I mean, you could always say more. But on this particular point, T.D. Jakes is exactly right. The preacher isn't called to give his opinion on anything. He's called to say what God says. That goes for the preacher and it goes for the preacher's church as well. Here are good words for every preacher and everybody else to ponder. I don't get to say what I think. I get to say what the Bible says. That brings us to number two. Believing the Bible means accepting the opposition it brings. Are you ready for that? I hope so. In verse 14, look how Paul put it. He said this to the, to the Thessalonians. He said, For you, brothers, became Im imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. That's verse 14. Here we have a piece of bad news. If you believe the Bible, you're going to have some strong, strong enemies. Here's the really bad news. When Paul writes, your own countrymen, he uses a word that is absolutely unique. It's not found anywhere else in the New Testament, but it's used right here. It means the people closest to you. 
And if you decide to believe the Bible is the word of God, many people who are very close to you will not share your faith at all. I've heard this testimony from several pastor friends. They were sometimes encouraged by well-meaning members of their congregation, including some of the leaders of their congregations, that they should not speak out so boldly about sin in their community because that might turn away the very people they're trying to reach. Now, I understand the concern of those church members and those church leaders. No one likes to be unpopular, right? We'd rather be part of a church that makes us feel good when we go about our life in the community. And there is a huge place in the church for ministries of compassion to our neighbors to lift up the hurting people that are all around us. But it's a little embarrassing when friends say, oh, you go to that church. And they don't mean it as a compliment either. That's no fun. It would be better if everyone loved us. But they don't. If they despise us for telling the truth about homosexuality, then so be it. If they think that we are narrow-minded and bigoted, then so be it. The truth is much different, of course. The church is filled with men and women who love God and love people. Let us say it and say it clearly. We don't hate anyone. We welcome everyone to attend our services. Our doors are open to all people without exception. We don't ask when people, when strangers come in, who were you sleeping with last night? And we're not going to start now. Some Christians and also some pastors think they can escape the opposition if they're hip and cool. But it won't work. Listen to these words by Carl Truman, who's a Christian theologian at Westminster Theological Seminary. He said this, you really do kid, your, kid only yourselves if you think you can be an Orthodox Christian and be at the same time cool enough and hip enough to cut it in the wider world. Maintaining biblical sexual ethics will be the equivalent in our culture of being a white supremacist. And I have no doubt that he's right. The day is fast approaching when Christians who stand on the Bible will be marginalized and ostracized in our, in our culture. It's happening as we speak. And the great debate will be exactly at this point. Will we stand under the authority of Scripture in the realm of sexual ethics? Already many so-called evangelical Bible-believing people are starting to squirm out from under the authority under the authority of scripture by playing fast and loose with the, biblical, with the biblical text. They're doing exactly what Gregory Wills talked about. Liberalism always starts inside the church as a means of taking away the sharp edges of our faith. And our faith has many sharp edges to it. No matter what others think about us, our deepest commitment must be to the Word of God. We preach it and teach it and proclaim it because it's the only hope for a dying world, right? I think I also need to say something about the quarter-inch deep theology that's spreading across the evangelical movement today. There are many false prophets out there, and Jesus says plainly, beware of false prophets. And one mark of a false prophet is that he does not speak plainly about what true believers can expect if they genuinely believe the Word of God and commit themselves to it. They're too busy writing books about how you can be a better you and how you can prosper in your Christian life to spend much time with turnoffs like marginalization, opposition, or even pain and suffering, or even following Jesus to the cross. The whole point of what I'm trying to say is that opposition and rejection and suffering is normal to the Christian life. It has always characterized true Christianity, always. The point here is that things are bad, but not as bad as they could be. In the early church, there was, from the very beginning, hostility and trouble and stress. We know from the book of Hebrews that some had been imprisoned and some had their property plundered, but it was not yet martyrdom. Though, as you well know from church history, that would come, and it would come hard. The stress level among Bible-believing Christians in many parts of the world today is huge. 
How do you sleep at night when being a Christian may result in mob violence in your village? Or someone ready to throw a torch in your house and burn it down? And that's exactly what I read every day in my Christian news sources. Of course, you almost never read that in the papers or see anything about that in major TV stations, right? But it's happening all over the world right now. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat any appeal for you to become Bible believers, of uh, Bible-believing followers of Jesus Christ. It will cause some painful changes in your life and if you resist any change that God calls you to, because it may cause you pain, let's be honest. You're not really ready to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're still on the outside. And you're still in need of conversion. I must say that because I realize the truth of that old saying, what you win them with is what you win them to. If we use compromising appeals in trying to bring people to the Lord, then we will win people to a compromising faith. And that's how liberalism gets shot through the society in which we live. Now there's yet a third answer to this question that I ask. Number three, believing the Bible means accepting its judgment on society. In verses 15 through 16, the Apostle Paul says this, they killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and they drove us out. And they displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as to always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. Those are strong words. These are sobering words. In these verses, Paul mentions four ways that the Jews opposed the early Christians. And this is not an attack, this is not an anti-Semitic attack or an attack on Jews. I'm talking about what Paul is speaking of. He says, number one, they killed Jesus and the prophets. Number two, they drove the apostles out of Jerusalem. Number three, they are hostile to all men. And number four, they hinder the preaching of the gospel. And the, it's that last point that grips Paul's mind and heart. You know, it's one thing to say, not for me, but it's okay for you. It's something else to say, not for me, and not for you, you either. If you prefer to stay in darkness, that's your privilege. But it's a terrible sin to put out the light so that others cannot see it. Mark it down. The greatest sin is not in refusing salvation. The greatest sin is trying to keep others from believing. If you prefer to go to hell, that's your business. But please don't try to take other people with you. Such people are all around us today. Not all unbelievers fit this pattern, but some do. They do all they can to oppose Christians who are actively seeking to win others to Christ. Now there's a clear example of this in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas, you remember that story in the book of Acts? Paul and Barnabas began their first missionary journey by going from Antioch to the island of Cyprus. And let me read the whole passage for you from Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 12. Quote, There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Verse 16 of our passage in 1 Thessalonians tells us two things about God's judgment on such people. First, they heap up their sins to the limit. 
Now that word means to fill to the brim. There's a limit, a line, and a point of no return for each person. No one knows when or where that point is. But that point of no return comes for nations, it comes for families, and it comes for individuals. Second, he said, wrath has come upon them. The word is both present and future. Although our God is patient in his patience, his patience has limits. Eventually, the storm clouds begin to roll in. And finally, they break over the heads of unbelievers. Though they be long delayed, the fires of God's judgment will come at last to those who reject the Lord. This is all from Scripture. I'm not spouting anything particular coming out of my own head. This is from Scripture. Please understand this. This is God's judgment on any society that rejects his revelation. No nation or individual can reject him without paying the price. No nation can sin forever without reaping a divine judgment. This is the final answer to the question. What does it mean to believe the Bible? If you believe the Bible, you must accept its judgment on society as well. Let me wrap up this message with two concluding thoughts. First, there are certain unchangeable facts which are true and which must be believed if we are to be truly Christian. These truths are not like the shifting tides of human opinion. They do not change with the latest, gospel, uh, uh, latest Gallup poll. These truths make Christianity what it is, and if they're ne neglected or denied, our faith begins to lose its foundation. Our supreme authority is the Bible. Like Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms, we say, our conscience is bound by the word of God. Here we stand. We can do no other. God help us. Now such a stand will not win us any brownie points with the world or with the local newspapers. Let me sharpen the point just a bit. Suppose someone were to ask why you are a Christian. It's not enough to, to say, well, I believe in Jesus because he solves all of my problems. That's really beside the point. We must not claim to be Christians simply because of some advantage we receive. We must believe because the message is from God and is therefore true. No other answer will suffice. Number two, we're men and women under authority. We are men and women under authority. That's the point that T.D. Jakes was trying to make to Oprah Winfrey. He was right about that. We don't have the right to change what God has said. We are heralds who announce to the world what God has said. If God has spoken, we don't debate his commands. We declare them. The gospel is good news to those who are ready to receive it. It's bad news to those who reject it. Scriptures are very clear about that. Now this is true for rich, for poor, for young, for old, for America, for Africa, and all the countries around the world. That's what we do when you're under authority. The late Chuck Olson was the founder of Prison Fellowship, whose headquarters is in Virginia. And in his office was a plaque containing these words. Faithfulness, not success. In God's plan, the values of this world are turned upside down. If you want to save your life, you have to lose it. If you want to become great, first you become a servant. If you want true success, then first learn to be faithful where you are. When we stand before the Lord, we may be very surprised to know that our bottom line and his bottom line are not the same. He won't ask you how much money we made, you made or, or lost, or you, he won't ask you how many cars you owned or whether you climbed to the top of your profession. His question on that day, on that day will be far simpler. His question will be, were you faithful in doing the task I gave you to do? If we can answer yes, our time on earth will have been well spent. Chuck Colson got it exactly right. It's faithfulness, not success, that matters most to God. It all begins with faithfulness to God's word, like the Christian chorus says. 
No turning back. No turning back. Believing the Bible is serious business. No turning back. No turning back. In the toughest location of Chicago, there was a church van parked on the street under the name of the church were these words. There is no substitute for the word of God. That's not very catchy, but you know what? It's true. And it sums up everything I've been trying to say in this message. There is no substitute for the word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for communicating to us very clearly about what the stakes are as we move through life. Help us to understand you are there to support us and help us, but you are also there to show us where to walk on the path that is in front of us. Help us, help us, Lord, to lead others to find that same path. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.